projects are going to come on, which one has a, a chance of sustainability through this market, I'm sure it's very tricky. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to be in your position at all. Yeah, Abira does um, majority of the hard work anyway. I'm just here to speak um, and, and ask some questions for whenever a, a reputable project does jump on. I appreciate the kind words. Um, I've gone ahead and I've, I've started the recording. So welcome everybody to another AMA at Beatles. Today, uh, we have a spectacular guest team and that, that team is Squid Grow. I remember watching these guys when they first launched and everyone was a little bit 50 50 on the edge and for everyone that did stand on the edge they missed out on some exponential gains and i'm talking this project like flew into the 50 mil range and that's that's just from the top of my memory you know i remember uh promoters like omar and a few others they were they were going hard at it they were pushing it and at the time there was a competitor and everyone had their doubts but then you know the real one stayed along prospered and and they're still here to to tell the story so today we have um shib toshi r dub and dane representing the team um I'd, I'd like to introduce um each of you all and please give a little bit of um uh, just like a background information on on what you guys do you know what inspired you and and, and these type of things you know just so the investors here for the first time have never seen the project can can find out what's going on behind the scenes or at least paint a picture for who the people are running the show all right perfect uh normally i would start this off but actually let's change it up let's start with dane then go to dub and then uh, i'll finish it up sure and uh so uh, just a brief bit about myself you guys have heard me a lot lately in the squid grow community but i'm here to talk to you in particular the guys from albedo so welcome to uh, our AMA here, and hopefully you can learn a bit, a thing or two about our project today. Uh, my name is Dan. I've been in crypto since 2016. I have a cybersecurity background. Fell in love with crypto the first time I heard about it in 2011, but unfortunately only made moves in 2016, 2017. So it's a bit late to the party compared to Shib and Dub, who you'll hear from here in a moment. But uh, I absolutely love this space. And as I progress through this space as a trader, sometime around 2019, 2020, I started to come into projects on a more personal level. And I got into the marketing side of things. And that's where I've kind of found my home for the most part. I've been involved with some fairly high profile projects ranging from BPRO and Veracity over to Floki, HODL Token, and uh, Hokkaida and Kishu back when they first launched. So I've kind of hopped around between multiple projects. I've also been involved with Blockchain Brothers Marketing Firm. Uh, which has introduced me to a ton of different types of projects. And I've actually worked with Domino before on a few things. So, uh, you know, familiar faces in here. I see tons of you guys. Uh, but that's a little bit about me, and uh, I'll pass it over to Dub. Thanks, Dane. Um, yeah, look, uh, my name's R. Dub. I have been in crypto originally probably since around 2011. But I didn't really come into the DeFi sector until around 2021. Um, originally as an investor, uh, and that's how I came across Ship Toshi. Uh, we ended up meeting each other uh, in a private whale room. Um, and from there, we kind of, you know, got talking a lot. And that's kind of how Squid Grow eventually started. But um, yeah, nowadays I spend most of my time uh, working on Squid Grow behind the scenes and also just looking at charts and kind of day trading. That's um, that's really where my passion is. So I kind of put all of my time into both of those things. Um, yeah, Shibtoshi. Hey, thank you, guys. What's going on, everybody? I'm Shibtoshi. Uh, I've been in the crypto space since 2011. Um, I first heard about Bitcoin in 2010. Um, I didn't immediately start dabbling into it until several months later. Uh, originally got into it for poker, online poker games. Some of my friends started talking to me about it. And uh, after I started deep diving into it, I was super intrigued. Made my first Bitcoin purchase of about 30K. Lost it the following day on the poker table. And it was off to the races for me. Um, I've invested in from I've invested in everything from Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, Zcoin, Ethereum. Um, my most notable trade, obviously, Shiba Inu, August first of 2020. I started dollar cost averaging into my position there. Um, but just to kind of give some insight into Squid Grow, um, obviously, as I said, I've been in crypto since 2011. 
I tried my best in the early days to get my, my friends and family into it. Everybody received crypto with being skept skeptical, um, not really understanding it. Um, as time progressed and my lifestyle started changing, obviously people started taking notice and wanted to know a little more about the crypto. As people started dabbling into it on their own, um, not really knowing how to do proper research on projects, you know, a lot of my friends and family started taking substantial losses. Um, you know, when Pink Sale came around, a lot of my buddies started jumping into every single Pink Sale that was launching there, hoping, you know, to, for massive games. Games, majority of the time, they just were getting rugged. Um, some of my very close friends started talking to me about launching my own project. This was in 2021. And uh, I really didn't want to take on the responsibility. I'm not a dev. I don't pretend to be a dev. Um, it wasn't something I was super interested in. But as time progressed over the next couple of months, more and more of my friends started taking losses. I started looking into it. I took some Solidity courses online. Actually took it twice. Tried to get a better understanding of coding. Epically failed at that. My first contract, I tried to code myself. I couldn't even properly deploy it on the test net. And then when I finally got it deployed, it didn't work correctly. So I kind of shelved the idea. And at the insistence of some of my friends that I spoke on earlier, I started playing around with the idea. And at the time, uh, the Netflix TV show Squid Games was real big. And also equally as big in the crypto space was a project called Evergrow, which I was a whale in. And I decided that I would combine the two names together kind of tackle the best of both worlds. And I came up with Squid Grow. I outsourced the coding of my contract from a developer I found on Code Mentor and had him code the contract. I believe the contract was done in November of 21. And, you know, through my struggle of trying to figure out how to deploy this thing, I realized I was late to the game. There was another project that already launched, Squid Games. It was, it was making a bunch of ripples through the space. Ultimately, this is the one that ended up rugging. But uh, I kind of shelved the idea and kind of moved on from it. Uh, some time went by. I met r -Dub in a whale room. And we started talking about crypto in general and the space and the settlement and all the scams that were going on. And I kind of threw out the idea that some of my friends have put out there about starting our own project. And as Dub and I went back and forth, we decided it was something that we could actually do. And I already had a contract and logos ready to go. So we decided to run with it. And we did a stealth launch June 17th of 2022. Unfortunately, I deployed that contract incorrectly. And in a matter of minutes, we realized that contract uh, could not be sold. So we had to do the hard thing and make the announcement to the community that we'd have to relaunch. So we shut that contract down. Luckily, liquidity was not locked at that point. And uh, we rolled out a new contract within 24 hours, transferred the liquidity, airdropped our community that we had. I think it was a total of about 89 people at that time and uh, went live with it. And it was off to the races since then. Um, our emphasis at Squid Grow is community. Obviously, when I started Squid Grow with r -Dub, Sorry, I think, um, I'm not sure. Did, did he cut out there? Yeah, yeah he cut out for me. Yeah, he cut out for me as well. He's a little bit Yeah. He was, he, was, he was leading into a great story there. Um, the back story <laughs> he was... Often, uh, he often does. <laughs> Uh, just a second. Hey, Shib, Shib, we can't hear you, man. Um, uh, we lost you. Uh, I sent him a text. Just give it a minute. So, yeah, um, yeah. Fa fairly, fairly familiar myself with, with the backstory about how he mentioned that there was another project making waves and ripples. And so it was very hard to distinguish whether whether the project squid grow itself was gonna was gonna pull the move but it it wasn't that long before it really took over um and 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 it was holding a decent floor it's, sorry guys I, I got rugged what's the last thing you heard 
All right, so basically you you were just rolling into the story about how there were there was a competitor out there um oh, and, man. and it was making ripples yeah um oh, man. It was, I was i was liking where the story was going to be honest just sorry about up. that I, I had a family member call me and it, it messed my telegram up yeah so um i was struggling to to deploy the contracts and around the time i i figured it out um i realized that there was another competitor already on the market squid games and it was making a bunch of ripples in the space this is the project that went on to be a rug pull um so we shelved i self shelved the idea and as time kind of progressed more and more of my friends started taking losses and it was around this time that i met r dub in that private whale room that he spoke of and we just started talking crypto in general started getting to know each other over the course of some months and i started talking about how my friends were kind of talking to me about doing our own project and uh, providing everybody a safe place to invest. And Dub liked the idea. We decided we were going to roll with it. And and um, ultimately, we decided to launch Squid Grow Stealth Launch June seventeenth. Um, and unfortunately, because I'm not a dev, I deployed the contract incorrectly. And we discovered within a matter of minutes, I deployed our contract with the Uniswap router and the Pancake Swap router together in the contract. So although the token could be bought, it could not be sold. So essentially the contract was a honeypot. So we had to make that hard announcement to the community and tell everybody that we were gonna pause trading and do a relaunch the following day. We rolled out a new contract. Luckily the liquidity was not locked. We airdropped, I believe our 89 holders that we had currently, their equivalent in squid grow tokens, transferred 100% of the liquidity and we went live. And um, I mean, that's it's been off to the races since then. Um, originally, when Squid Grow was conceptualized, it was to give my friends and family a safe place to invest. Obviously, that's expanded to my community currently. And uh, we're taking this time in this market to uh, develop our utilities and grow our community. So when the market turns back around, we're established. And now not only are we a meme token, but we're a utility meme token. We've got utilities. We've got audits. We've got a nice big active community and that's that's what we're doing with our time currently yeah it's amazing um and and timing is good uh, at least from from what i can tell timing has never been better especially with what's happening with xrp and the whole market following so mm. um I, I honestly believe that things are going to turn for the better in the near future um it's clear that you guys are bulls you've been in the market you've tried to convince friends and family to get into crypto early before it exploded and for you to have the capacity to do that says wonders so a market like this probably doesn't even shake you in the first place i like what you're doing uh in in the sense of you've you've given people a safe place to invest and they can just hold and stake and you know do whatever they want to do you know it's safe to sleep on the tokens nowadays that is very rare um so yeah thank you for what you've done for the space um can, can you give us a little bit of information about like the the utilities you guys have because i see that there's staking i see that there's a swap you have you're listed yeah. on several exchanges including gate io which is crazy yeah sure thing uh, and one of the things that i didn't kind of go over because i got cut off um but i didn't revisit that is you know our emphasis on liquidity building um uh, you know our we are a tax token. We are currently a 4% buy tax, 10% sell tax, 10% transfer tax. And, um, you know, wh why, why invest into us over others that are like zero, zero? Well, the project itself does not keep any of the tax. 100% of the tax goes to our liquidity. And so I have a very strong emphasis on liquidity building. Um, I don't want any of my community members to find themselves in a similar situation like I did with SHIB, where you're sitting on a massive bag and there's not enough liquidity to actually pull profits without hurting the chart substantially. So there's that. We are a tax token. Um, as far as what we have currently to offer to the community is very early on, we rolled out staking contracts for native coin staking and liquidity staking. Um, for the better half of a year, we were offering extremely high APRs to our community, unlocked, no locking periods. 
And um, we kind of scaled down from 250% APR down to uh, 20% APR. And then recently with our launch of Ethereum, we bumped the Ethereum APR or we debuted the Ethereum contracts APR at 100% for the first 30 days. And then for our anniversary, we bumped our BSC APR up to 100% as well. Uh, with our staking contracts, there is a 2% in tax, 2% out tax, and a 6% harvest tax of your rewards. And if you're asking where does this tax go, it goes back into the staking contracts to help with sustainability. Um, obviously, you know, we could probably get by um, without running a tax on our contracts, but it would not be sustainable. And, you know, at, at some point eventually without being able to sustain the APRs, staking would have to go because of running out of tokens. So we have substantially scaled down our APRs currently. There are 10 there are ten percent across the board. The tax is still in place. There is no locking periods. We are, you know, uh, we do offer a very reasonable APR. Um, a lot of projects will offer you a, a lesser of an APR with a locking period. I don't believe in locking periods myself, so therefore I do not implement them. Uh, but we do have that. You know, that kind of is a way that we are giving back to our community while we are taking this time to develop. Um, the last six months before we migrated to our new contract, we gave out about $1.8 million. Uh, the last 30 days of the Ethereum staking contract, we gave out about $700,000 to our community. Um, so there, there's that. Um, as far as additional utilities, uh, currently we do have our own swap, SGS. Um, Currently, you can only buy, sell, and trade Squid Grow and some of the basics, BNB, Ethereum, some of the stable coins. Uh, we have yet to list any other projects on that swap, although we are in talks with uh, other projects, one in particular, that we will probably be pulling the trigger on uh, here in the near future. Um, in addition to that, we do, obviously, with the debut of Ethereum, and our ILO raised raise that we did with that, where we raised about a million dollars in about a 26 hour period. All of that liquidity raised obviously went to liquidity. The project did not keep any of it. Um, we do have a bridge currently with the bridge attacks that have been going on in the space. We have shut our bridge down um, just as a precaution. We don't want our community um, or our bridge to, to go under attack and anybody, you know, be at jeopardy of losing funds. So currently with the bridge attacks, I have shut it down. I have blacklisted the bridge addresses. So if, it, if our bridge, it does happen to get compromised, our tokens will be not will not be lost and there will be no harm to our charts. Um, we have also partnered with Mike S. Miller from DC Comics, Marvel and Game of Thrones. He is doing our 10,000 piece NFT collection. And within this collection, we have 100 ultra rare NFTs where we have incorporated blue chip NFTs as well. So I spent about $300,000 back before the market fell substantially to purchase uh, blue chip NFTs. I purchased everything from mutant apes, doodles, kennel clubs, metaverse land, uh, goblins. Um, the list kind of goes on. But we have incorporated those into our NFT collections, very similar to what my Twitter PFP looks like. That is an example of our ultra rare NFTs. And if you mint our NFT and you are lucky enough to mint one of our ultra rares, which is pictured holding holding a Polaroid picture of a, the blue chip NFT, you, you get ownership of both. You get two NFTs for the price of one, our NFT and the one that's pictured. Uh, this is on a redeeming basis. So you will either have to contact us to speed the process up so we can airdrop you that blue chip NFT, or we will just go through the chains and airdrop the holder of that NFT, the, the, the NFT that goes with the um, the PFP, or excuse me, that goes with the uh, uh, Mike Miller collection that they purchased. Um, there is that. We are in the process of developing our own NFT marketplace uh, to debut the Mike Miller collection. But before the Mike Miller collection drops, we do have a smaller uh, NFT collection that's limited to 1,000. This is the only collection that we have publicly stated the prices on. These will be priced out at $25 a piece. There is zero utility with these 
a thousand collection. They are just PFPs. But when it comes to the Mike Miller NFT collection, we do have utilities, some of which I will speak on now. Um, one of the utilities that we have um, for the Mike Miller collection is the ability to stake that NFT in our staking contracts to boost your APRs if you are currently staking Squid Grow token. So you have to be staking Squid Grow token and then you stake one of our NFTs and it boosts your rewards. Um, in addition, we are incorporating our NFT collection into our um, main utility, STX, which is our perpetual exchange, which is currently under development. And you will be able to stake our NFTs on our platform to get reduced trading fees on your perpetuals. So that's something that's also unique um, with our collection. We do currently have seven Surtech audits. Um, everything we put out has been audited. We are ranked currently, I believe, in the top 10% of Surtech. Last I looked, we were around an 83 ranking. Uh, so not too bad. Um, but as far as the NFT marketplace, I will pass this to, to Dub because this is actually Dub's brainchild. A lot of the features that the we are going to be offering <clears throat> on our marketplace came from Dub. So with that, go ahead yeah. and take it, Dub. Thanks, Shib. Um, yeah, so look, I, I won't go too much into details about the NFT marketplace, but basically, like when we when we set out to build an NFT marketplace, obviously, there's already a lot of them out there on the market. So when we were, you know, um, venturing into this endeavor, we thought like, you know, how can we kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, set ourselves apart from what's currently out there. So we've kind of put a really big focus on the features that we're going to be, um, you know, having on our NFT marketplace. And um, I will speak on like one of the things that we are going to be um, offering. And so what that is, is that via our NFT marketplace, basically, um, even with no developer experience, you will be able to basically create um and mint and list your own NFT collection. So in essence, it's kind of like um, what would be described as an NFT launch pad, basically. And I'm sure that these do exist out there. I'm not, not saying that they don't exist at all, but um, I'm yet to see one that's kind of used in the mainstream. So that's, um, that's like one of the um, rarer features of our nft marketplace i probably i probably don't want to go into too many of the details just because we haven't actually spoken on them yet um but what i can say is that it's coming along really nicely um shib and i are really like putting a lot of attention into how it looks um all the way down to the logo which we've been designing now for what weeks maybe shib um, yeah, I but, mean, we, we um, yeah, it's it's a process. Obviously, name selection was, you know, the first half of that. And after we decided on a name, which we have not publicly um, spoke on yet, it went to logo design. So we have some designs we're playing around with, um, some that I like, some that I like less. You know, ultimately, we will make a decision as far as the team goes. And that will be the uh, the logo that we trademark. Yeah. But yeah, lots um, lots of time and effort going into this at the moment, and I'm sure anyone that's kind of already familiar with Squid Grow knows that um, you know when we do things, we like to make sure that they can be basically perfect. So um, you know the NFT marketplace is coming along really nicely, um, but once it is completely finished in terms of development, obviously it will also go through an audit process as well. Um, and then after audit, it will be ready for launch. Yeah, correct. You know, I like to say, you know, obviously I have a great emphasis on security and, um, a lot of our utilities, I like to say our audits have audits. So we really scrutinize our, our auditing process. We do penetration tests, bug bounties, um, you know, and <clears throat> we like to have an, uh, a, a known auditing company do our audit. So currently I am favoring Surtech. And uh, as I said, we have seven Surtech audits currently, uh, but we will be having many more audits to come, you know, in the future. Um, in regards to um, the exchanges that we're listed on, I believe currently we are listed on 
10, 11, something like that. Uh, we were listed on two more, but unfortunately those exchanges went belly up. So, you know, we lost the funding that we had on those exchanges, but I believe currently we're listed on 10 or 11. Our first exchange listing was BKEX and Bitmark. Uh, we managed those listings before we were even listed on CoinMarketCap. And uh, shortly thereafter, um, we listed on Gate.io and several others following suit. Currently, uh, I am on the exchange listing path again. Uh, we have currently signed two contracts for exchanges, uh, but I aim to pair those two exchanges with several other exchange listings and we will fire those out in squid grow fashion. But um, so that's kind of where we're at currently um, with exchanges. Um, Dane, you have anything to add? Yeah, I would, I would say that, you know, people that have been here since the beginning for squid grow remember very well when we did this in the past, we, we paired, I think it was like four exchanges in a single week. And that coincided with the time when we pumped up to 53 million for our all time high. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see something like that again with these exchanges. You never, re never really can be a predictor of price, but things sure do look good today in the markets. And uh, knowing that we've got these in a pipeline, I think the the time to drop these could not be better. So I'm excited to see what they can do. Uh, and, mo and more than that, I'm also excited to see, uh, you know, us being multi-chain. We're on ETH now as of a month ago. It'll be the first time that we've actually got our ETH supply and our BSC, BSC supply on an exchange. So that will be interesting to see in the back end for for us as a team, and I think it'll be another way for people to get both supplies, which is which is great for investors. So I like that, and uh, I think exchanges are always exciting, regardless of your opinions of them. They do seem to have that all factor, that wow factor for investors. Um, so that's always an exciting thing to drop, you know, win or lose. Uh, and with that said, there was one other utility I'd like to touch on briefly, and that would be our SAM. Um, one of the things that makes the Squid Grow name unique, you know, without getting into the origins of the name, but giving light, uh, giving meaning to that name is SAM. So it stands for Squid Grow Absorption Machine. And we actually have built into our ETH contract, which is new, uh, an ability to absorb projects liquidity into our own. So kind of like the tentacles of a squid, we're always seeking new projects, basically that are kind of like either on their way out and they're kind of out of options and out of volume and the, the developers are good people and they don't want to just call it quits and rug the token so we kind of give them an out where we're able to bring that project into squid grow make them you know the, who they were originally holders from their project into holders of squid grow uh, in a very streamlined fashion um, there's a lot of protocol when it comes to finding suitable candidates so it's not as easy as it sounds but it is something that makes us very unique having that programmed into our contract. And not only do we look for projects that are smaller um, and, and kind of on their way out, but we're also on the lookout for projects with some brand and some staying power. So that, that kind of keeps us on our toes. Uh, we have submissions, you know, pretty much every week coming in for different projects to see if they can be absorbed by that arm of squid grow. So um, I think you covered the rest of the utilities pretty well, but that's a, that's a very unique one that really gives life to the name Squid Grow. Yeah, and just to, to go a little further on that, um, as Dane said, we do have our SAM absorption machine coded into our contract. We have not yet used it on our Ethereum. We have successfully absorbed one other project on BSC. It was uh, relatively went off without a hitch. Um, and just kind of touching base on the process and what we look for when it comes to projects to absorb. We are looking for uh, projects that have unburnt liquidity and that the owners of those of that project have not renounced contract. That's important because when we announce to the, their community that we are going to absorb them and after a set amount of time and some notice to that community, we have the ability to or the, the dev has the ability to cease trading on that contract. And what that allows us to do is freeze everything the way it is so we can take our snapshots and run our analytics. And once we have ran our analytics, we are able to take the liquidity, take the holders and find out um, the, the ratio of token that that community is going to receive to us. Um, you know, the, the first uh, project that we absorbed, they retained, uh, I believe, 80 to the 90s of dollar value on that project because they had great liquidity. 
Um, some of the other projects that we've spoke to have been as low as 16% value retention. So obviously not an ideal situation for the community in a situation like that. I would not move forward with an acquisition uh, because we would just be absorbing a bunch of community members that just are unhappy because they're, they, they're losing substantial dollar value. But we look for unlocked liquidity or liquidity that's not been burnt and that is unlocking in the near future and then with contracts that are not renounced. And then a community that is receptive to the idea because we don't want to force upon ourselves an absorption if the community is not for it. So it's definitely a, you know, kind of a balancing act. We, as Dane said, we do get a lot of submissions. Unfortunately, a lot of these projects that hit us up um, are not really fit for an absorption because their liquidity to market cap ratio is pretty poor. And, you know, we got to think about that community, you know, going into an absorption. You know, I don't want to force anybody into if they have $100 in token of this other project, their value retention is going to be $10. I mean, that would absolutely upset me if I was a member of that community. So we do look for projects that have good liquidity to market cap ratio. And uh, I'm not opposed to absorbing larger um, projects. Um, we were previously in talks with a much larger project. Unfortunately, that deal kind of fell through with some of the ins and outs of the negotiation. But I'm not opposed to absorbing larger projects, much larger than ourselves. But the easiest way forward would be projects similar in size to us, if not a little smaller uh, when it comes to SAM. But I'm definitely looking forward to actually utilizing our SAM contract and um, moving forward with that. It's all about just finding a contender that's compatible. Yeah, well, there's a lot going on behind the scenes for Squid Grow, uh, as we had just heard. Uh, a lot of long-term vision going on and unique utilities that I've never heard of before. Just that last one that, that Dane just mentioned and Chip Toshi followed up on. Um, I kind of like the idea and also like the fact that, you know, there's potential for, for you to be, I guess, partnering up with projects in the future um, because that, that the exposure from that is always good uh, on both sides as long as it doesn't backfire. So there's, there's obviously a lot going on, and I like the vision. Um, if there's anything else you guys want to touch up on, um, be, feel free to speak. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow some people to start asking some questions, whether that's from the Squid Grow community or from Abito's community, because I have a lot of questions, and I'm assuming these guys do too. So if you guys are ready, um, we can go straight into that. Let's do it. Alrighty, um, yeah. I'm gonna. Sorry, go ahead, Dave. Oh, I'm saying I'm game too. Whatever you're gonna. Alrighty, uh, I'm gonna unmute uh, Timmy, Timmy, Ethan, Dev, as well as Chris, Jim, and we'll go uh, one at a time, please, guys, so we're not speaking over each other. So you are you both unmuted, uh, Timmy. You can ask away. Uh, you're unmuted. You just gotta press the button. Thank you. So my question is for Shiptoshi, like. I know you launched Squid Grow when like the market was pretty rough. What exactly was your marketing strategies like the entire time you guys were heading towards ATH while the rest of the market was on a downward spiral? Oh man, um, uh, I mean, we were doing a little bit of uh, a little bit of everything at that time from um, a lots of AMAs, call channels. PR articles, uh, exchange listings. Um, Dane would probably be better equipped to kind of circle back to the marketing as he's the CMO. But just off the top of my head, we we had an awful lot going on at that time. And, you know, in the market downturn, as we were pushing up, push, I mean, that got us I mean, that got us a lot of uh, attention in the space. But Dane, uh, will you take this gentleman's question? Yeah, I really like your question. I can talk for a long time about it. Uh, without going on too much of a tangent, I would just say this. I think that when a project is born, there's a pattern that it follows. You've seen that with every meme coin from the past few months. You've seen that from every project pretty much um, that's come around in the past three years. In that, and that pattern always kind of looks similar. You get on a few exchanges, you get on CMC, you get on CG, you go through some call channels. 
you, you do that thing, right? So when we were going through that phase to your question, uh, we weren't getting any sleep. Uh, it was an absolute mad scramble. We did everything we could to get up to that point. But as an as an, as inevitable, I think, uh, especially in a bearish condition, uh, when things go up and the liquidity ratio gets kind of um, off or, or smaller, so to speak. It yeah, when, you're, when your supply starts to stretch, I understand when you go into supply shock, your LP lowers. Yeah, yeah so, so I mean, I, I, another thing that we did, uh, I'm sorry, Dane, just a real quick on the LP thing. Another thing that we did around this time is I had dropped our buy tax to about 1%. So when we started the initial push up to our all-time high, I believe it was 52 million market cap for 2000 X's. Um, our liquidity to market cap ratio was about 7%, and which is great, real healthy. Yeah, um, on BSC, that's awesome. Yeah, agreed. But, you know, as I started just coming in, uh, I had a lot of buy pressure, but no sell, tra no, no sell pressure. So only 1% of all, all the buys we're going to LP and hardly any sells. So our LP ratio started stretching thin. And I think by the top, we were in the two to 3% LP to market cap ratio. And then as people start peeling profits and dumping, we had one whale notoriously dump about 480 grand, um, you know, it, which indirectly fed our liquidity, which was a beautiful thing. But uh, unfortunately, you know, for those moments after it sucked, but, um, you know, we fell back down after that to about 12 million. And then we announced that we were listing five or six exchanges that week and we shot back up to 32. And, you know, since we had a period of uh, trading laterally, which helped with our liquidity building. And currently, I believe we're around 5% liquidity to market cap ratio, um, which is, I, you know, in the that's like acceptable or especially for the market cap that's that's very ideal yeah i think the most you go too heavy and, and it's harder to moon right you you want to keep your investors, so you want them to see that you're constant that that their bags are constantly growing so i 100 percent understand that now my now my second question is because you all started off as a meme and then you wanted to transition into utility how did that how did that look like how did your investors like take that because i know some people only get into the memes and then want utility utilities and stuff like that because everybody's scared of the word utility in this space yeah. a lot of times yeah. like how did how did you convince your community that what you were doing was in the best interest for your project well right out of the gate when we launched um we told our community that we planned on developing utilities uh early june is actually when we started developing our perpetual exchange so um from the beginning we indicated that we were going to be a utility token uh a meme is something that's fun it can it can garner some hype short term but the sustainability of a meme hype you know unless you're you know one of the lucky few you know it's it's, it's hard to sustain that that hype and attract those uh, investors. So we start shifting gears to our utility. And, you know, it's something so, that we've talked. Go ahead. Sorry, go, go ahead. Okay, so like when your floors are sitting there and they're holding and your TGs are dead and, you know, you've built your floors, like how, what, what were you doing to bring in the new eyes? Like, I understand like all the marketing, but like, you know, like you can do all the marketing in the world sometimes, but you just don't captivate the it. right e group exactly. of people. Exactly. And, and that that's very true. I mean, you, I've, I've thrown a lot of money at marketing and I've not got the, uh, the response on the chart that I had hoped for, obviously. Uh, you know, when it comes to marketing, it's one of those things that are ever evolving from, from week to week. Is what works doesn't work this week. So it's a continuous uh, re revolving door of, you know how to market a project so me personally what i have done is i have physically placed people around me to help with these uh marketing ideas you know and obviously you know doug and i we have our, our own connections but um to trying to you know uh find the right blend uh right balance is the word of of marketing and development at, at the same time you know it is one of those tricky things it's something that you know, we are working on currently, um, but just continuously moving forward and just doing what we've always set out to do, which was develop in this market. You know, there's a lot of projects that 
do wither away and die because their marketing funds are dependent on volume. Well, all of our tax goes to liquidity. I fund all of our development and marketing out of my own wallet. Okay, so, so you're you know, like in the same boat I'm in right now then too. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, so, and, and that's that's one thing that did uh, generate some hype for us. Um, you know, I, I fund everything, every aspect of the project from all the exchange listings to the um, marketing to the development of the project uh, i fund it all so one of the unique things about us is we're not dependent on volume uh, it doesn't matter if we're up down or sideways the, the marketing budget's still there it's still flowing we're still utilizing it um there was a point in time that you know we did scale up for our utilities up to 112 developers it was a bit of an overkill um, but due to the time differences with those developers i didn't feel like i was getting my money's worth so we just recently uh, parted ways from that dev house, obviously taking all the, the source codes that we had and we moved to USA based dev. And now we got a great dev. Uh, he goes by Katamari to the community and he's just, nice. he's just an all-star in my personal opinion. But, um, you know, we also have his circle of devs and some other devs that are on projects working with us and, uh, we're just continuing to develop, but it is a balancing act of finding out what works, you know, um, uh, we've done, Bitcoin.com articles. We've done uh, partnerships with the next crypto gym, you know, one of, as one of the main sponsors of the TV show, um, listings, spaces. I mean, we've kind of just we've done it all. Done it all. Um, yeah, Dana, we did if, the uh, campaign in yeah. Africa as well with flus. That was cool. Flues, yeah. yeah, it was. Um, Dane came up with a great idea. It's the uh, Squid Bro World Tour um originally we set out to pick three winners top prize was two thousand dollars usdt ultimately because of all the submissions you know it was really hard to narrow it down to the top three so decided to make it the top 16. um but you know just kind of outside of the box thinking giveaways on twitter engagement you know competitions i bought a lot of original art from mike s miller from the injustice comic book series which he signed and we do Twitter giveaways with that, where essentially you have to like, comment, retweet type of thing you, through Gleam, and winners are selected that way. Just you know, continuously trying to grow our following, which attracts the bigger exchanges and keeps the community engaged and gives them something to do, you know, and the potential of of winning a prize. You know, I mean, it's a really bad, it's a real tricky tricky thing yeah you know, marketing community is engagement is like re a really 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 big thing so like doing trivias and giveaways and things like that and you're giving out like signed comic books and shit so that's like super bullish and i'm gonna put that note in my back pocket um but so you know, I think I've gotten quite a bit of insight and honestly, Shib, it would Shib Toshi, it would be like super cool if we could maybe uh sit down sometime. Um and maybe you could just give me a little bit of advice. Um, because you know, well, you are you are a dev that I look up to. Like your your entire team is so bullish to me. Uh so like that would be just something super cool for me, like an it, accomplishment basically. If you um join our community drop me a message and then tag me in the main tg when i go through to check messages and i see your tag i will i will see your message and respond to it i think i have something off the top of my head that might immediately help you um <clears throat> it's essentially a blueprint of what we have done in the early days we call it our brown paper it's every move that we made getting us up to the 52 million dollar market cap so that yeah, might be, that might like that handy. would be that'd be super cool because I have a shit ton of money dumped into a utility well before I I deployed and I'm just having trouble getting you know I'm not even really having trouble I won't even say that because I have to go slow because I got to optimize servers and everything else but yeah. um like it's just keeping the captivation during that time of development and it's not even like i'm making my community wait very long like they don't have much much more longer to wait before you know i give them some pretty sweet alpha and like and, and you're like one of the biggest alpha devs you know that would even you know allow me to come up here and speak to you so like insight from you would be super bullish 
Well, <clears throat> uh, thank you. Thank you for the compliments. You know, as I said, if you reach out to me on, on TG, I'll be more than happy to discuss with you, um, you know, kind of what we did in the early days. You know, I am good for some connections, you know, assuming that those connections are, are interested. Um, you know, there's that. We've got exchanges. We've got Mario in the fall. We've got, you know, influencers. Uh, and we've got our blueprint of what got us to 52 million. Now, I can't guarantee, obviously, that our brown paper will work for you. It worked for us, but I'd be happy to give that to you. It's not something I hand out, you know, often, but from time to time when I am approached um, and I'm feeling generous, I'll, I'll hand that out. I appreciate so, that. I really appreciate your time tonight. So, yeah, don't mention it. Just um, when you hit me up, just remind me that I spoke to you previously. Yeah. On the show. Absolutely. And that kind of just, you know, I, I just, I'll remember the conversation. You know, a lot of times I get messages of just hi or hello. I know. Uh, that I, doesn't, that doesn't I was really, really bad. I was, yeah, I'm, I'm really bad at that sometimes too, especially when like your team's like, here, you got to message this person and message this person and message this person. And you're messaging all these people. And then you're like, I don't even know who I messaged anymore. If I could give you, if I could give you some advice just from personal experience, um, you know, it's one of the creeds that we have in Squid Grow under promise over deliver. Just be very cautious when you are talking to your community about things that you are developing because as you are a developer you know kind of the ins and outs uh, of developing a utility and you know sometimes things do not go according to the timeline so just be you know, yeah that was that was one thing like like i like to use timelines sometimes to shake out bigger wallets because they're sitting there with the expectation of a pump coming soon and then when it doesn't come they'll just exit and and it makes it so much easier to recover the chart than if they were to exit on you over a mill or something i i don't disagree with that um just from personal experience like me personally as an investor um you know the first time a project tells me a timeline and they miss that timeline okay i'll, I'll give them that but if it happens again, I lose all confidence in the project. I feel like I'm being misled. And then it's usually about that time that I start exiting my position. So just be yeah. cautious with, with those things because, you know, obviously. See, that, that's good advice. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have looked at it like that, you know, because I've always just been diamond handed. Like it's always been moon or dust for me, everything I've ever yeah. bought. You know, so well. I mean, that, that it's just, I, it's can, I know it's I, a bad habit. I, I know it's a bad yeah. Habit. I can respect you know, that completely, to, but yeah, it, it's healthy. It's healthy to pill profit. You know, pill pro yeah, profit responsibly. Yeah. Then you, then nobody makes money. Yeah, so exactly. Cool, man. Awesome. But I look awesome. I, I look forward to I look forward to chatting with you, buddy. Thanks for coming up. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Timmy, for the for the questions and 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 possibly some potential future partnership or something going on there um that was great um chris jam uh if you wanted to ask away you're, you're still on mute you just gotta press that button he may not be here anymore that's that's fine that's understandable but we still have a bunch more questions so i'm gonna allow um goldberg at icy lounge to speak you are unmuted if you want to ask away. All right, unfortunately, probably not there as well. Guys, if you're not here, actually, that doesn't work. Guys, please have your hand raised if you want to ask some questions. We have a bunch of people. So I'm going to unmute Church Boy and Hector. You're both unmuted. Um, Church Boy, yeah, oh, I, I see you going. Go, Go for it. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, okay, I was just curious when she was um speaking, he made mention of um the taxes going to liquidity and staking. So, just curious to know how does the team generate revenue to um on some activities and also for the deployer of um, other projects, do we have any like criteria or uh, meet any expectations of what particular kind of liquidity? project need to have before um integrating it and do you um also think of maybe um taking the holders of a project you are trying to integrate um those integrate them to your project like buying of um little little projects get their holders in a way um, increasing your old holders and also increasing your market cap and the liquidity they're about 
Hey, church boy, real quick, can I get you just to, to ask one question in a row, uh, you know, to, so I can easy, more easily uh, keep track? I okay, was having first, trouble first, hearing your first question. Okay, first question, like, um, you made mention that the taxes, they go to liquidity and sticking. How does the team generate revenue? We don't How does it revenue? We, we don't she, generate. She yeah, pays for everything out of pocket. Correct. Uh, our project is uh, not generating any revenue or profits. Um, everything goes back to liquidity. I fund everything out of pocket. And at this at this point, you know, I'm several million out of pocket with developments and exchange listings. So I fund everything. Uh, so the project itself is not generating any profits. Um, uh, our time will come for uh, revenue generation down the road with perpetual our perpetual exchange. Um, but as you know as it stands currently i'm currently funding everything out of pocket so we are not generating any revenue whatsoever um and all the taxes on chain go to L lp so you know i i fund everything so we're not generating revenue currently yeah that's kind of a unique thing too it's worth mentioning ship tells she's pretty humble about that typically if you heard some ceo was funding everything out of pocket you might think that's bearish but um, you know, Shiptoshi is Shiptoshi. If you look at his background, you'll understand why that's bullish. And it allows us to have all those taxes going directly into liquidity that makes profit taking a lot more healthy. Well, that, that's so cool. Then the second question is um, concerning integrating other projects. Um, do you have any specifications or um, requirements of a particular liquidity the project needs to uh, be hoped to before integrating it to your um, community or whatever? Then also, do you also look at maybe um, when you integrate a project to your community, like buying uh, little, little projects, buy their liquidity, their holders in a way, also boosting your your project and liquidity they are about? There, there are two, two main things, that, as we touched on earlier, that we look for with an acquisition. First of all, is the liquidity. Um, is the liquidity burnt? If the liquidity is burnt, then it is not viable for us to try to acquire them because we would have to amass um, a large amount of tokens to then sell on the chart to try to recover that liquidity. And ultimately we would never be able to get hundred percent of that liquidity out. Um, so there's that. So the liquidity has to either be locked and is unlocking in the near future or is currently unlocked. Uh, second to that, we look for projects where the contracts have not been renounced uh, for the reason being that when we decide to go forward with an acquisition, the owner of that contract can then, after some notice to the community, pause the contract completely. And once there is no longer any buys, sells, or transfers on that project, we can run analytics on that chart, factoring in the holder count, the liquidity, and we can run analytics to determine um, if it's even viable to acquire, meaning that, you know, we will you know, through the, through the uh, analytics, we will determine if their community is going to take a substantial loss or not. If the community is going to be taking a substantial loss, this is a reference that I used earlier, if an investor has $100 in this token that we're looking to acquire, but after the acquisition, they're only going to receive $10 of Squid Grow token, that would not be very viable to us to try to acquire them because we're going to have a, a community that's going to be upset with the acquisition. Um, additionally to that, um, we, um, what was I, I lost my train of thought. Additionally to that, um, you know, ideally we want a, a community that is open to the idea of an acquisition, not necessarily a project that is dying. Uh, unfortunately, you know, in this market that we are, we are in, we find a lot of projects that are, are struggling, but you know, we, we look for developers of a project that, you know, kind of wants the best for their community, but just, you know, in the current situation does not have the, either the funding or the ability to, to push that project any further, then we will step in and breathe life into the community. Once again, by, by giving them squid grow token, they then become our community and we take care of them. You know, they're on the journey with us for all our utilities and our growth from there forward. Um, so those are kind of some of the factors that we look for when it comes to acquisition. Uh, but the main, the, the two main ones is liquidity can't be burned. It can't be an unreasonable locking period on the liquidity. I mean, if it's a five-year locking period, 
that's not of interest to us. But we're talking, you know, liquidity that unlocks in a couple months, that would be an ideal situation. And then also the contract ownership is still owned, it's not renounced. All right, it makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Buckstone, for the opportunity. Yeah, don't All good. Thank, thank you for the question. All right. Yeah. Um, Hello. Uh, yeah, yeah, Goldberg, go ahead, man. All right. Um, um, it's a really um honorable uh, moment having you up. Um, um, it's really late to my side, but when I saw you on the VC, now nah, I got, I had to stay. <laughs> I had to stay to hear from himself. So I have a question though. Um, I see you breezed from um BSC to it, and I want to know if there was any sort of challenges because I've been to a previous project and they bridged from BSC to it and they had certain challenges and some sort of problems, you know, um, you know, why bridging the market cap of each supposed to be, you know, same and balanced, but theirs were in balance. They had a lot of problems. So I want to know if you had some certain challenges while doing um, the bridging in, um, you know, Screedle. So <clears throat> when we started the process um, of the actual ETH launch, obviously we had been planning it for some time, but when we started the process and we started our initial liquidity offering phase, um, we looked at the BSC chart and we went with our lowest trading price on the exchange, which at that time was about $23 million. Uh, so we decided that we were going to launch ETH at the 23 million evaluation. So we opened up our liquidity offering. As I said, we raised 540 Ethereum, which is a little over a million dollars. In the process of the ILO, uh, we did see a downturn on BSC. Now, I could not um, recite the actual price of BSC, but it did drop below the 23 million evaluation. So right out the gate um you know bsc was a little lower than the ethereum so we did the ilo then we did the token trade-in where we allowed our community to trade in the bsc tokens to receive uh, ethereum tokens with a bonus of three percent um and after liquidity was seeded uh we we launched eth and about a week and a half two weeks after eth went live we opened the bridge um but during that time we did see um some price fluctuation in between the two chains and uh we opened up our bridge obviously there was transfers and arbitrage from bsc to ethereum some transfers back through um for the most part our price say, stayed pretty consistent you know between about 12 percent price difference don't hold me to that that's just off the top of my head but we didn't see any major um, price fluctuations on our bridge. In our particular situation with our bridge, um, I allocated 120 trillion tokens into the bridge on both, or excuse me, on the Ethereum chain. And 120 trillion tokens were then transferred from BSC to the Ethereum chain. chain. And then we, we ran into the situation where essentially the the reserve that we put into the east side was kind of depleted so uh there was still the ability to transfer back and forth um you know for several days but ultimately it got to the point where people were bridging uh bigger bags from bsc to ethereum uh and there was not sufficient enough tokens on the opposing chain they in our particular situation with our bridge they were then issued essentially iou tokens and uh after you know several committee members you know fell into this category we turned off the east side of the bridge and was allowing our ETH tokens to build uh, before we turned it back on and during this process their uh, bridges started becoming under attack so we have paused our bridge completely right now but um you know generally you know i'm, I'm pretty happy with the way that the bridge um launched um not really any major complaints for me um you know within the first couple hours of our bridge going live we were pretty congested as i said we had about 120 trillion tokens transfer from one side to the other which congested us pretty good but um 
ultimately, you know, I mean, there's always room for improvement, you know, when it comes to these types of things. But, uh, you know, there wasn't any sufficient damage done to our charts when we opened up the chain. So all in all, you know, I'm pretty happy with, you know, how it went. Uh, there was obviously a couple things that probably could have been executed a little more smooth. All in all, I'm pretty happy with the way that everything turned out. Yeah, yeah. Um, to get the last question in, because we don't want to take more time, um, it's based on the harvesting and um, restake. Um, so when harvesting and restaking, like, does the harvest, um, you know, just put the rewards um, in our wallets minus the six percent, or how does it really work? Okay, uh, let me just run you through uh, the process of staking, and you can just correct me if I missed your question. So, <clears throat> essentially, on SDS, our, our swap, our staking contracts are integrated into that. Uh, when you just when you deposit your tokens into the staking contract, there is a two percent fee off of the total value of your bag. Uh, the two percent fee then goes into the staking contract to help help it be sustainable um as you generate rewards within our staking contract we have a harvesting function on our dashboard that you can just harvest your rewards and you harvest those rewards whatever the re reward amount is you are taxed six percent on those harvest rewards not your whole bag but just on the rewards that you were harvesting and then as you harvest those those, those tokens go back into your wallet and you can compound those if you'd like or you can take profit on them or you can do whatever you want to do with them um so that's the harvesting function and then if the time comes that you want to exit the staking contract completely you can withdraw your tokens and when you withdraw your tokens there is a two percent fee uh as you're pulling your tokens out yeah 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 i i, I get that more now yeah <laughs> it sounds better when you say it <laughs> it was pretty confusing when i um looked at it myself yeah thanks yeah, um, back, Sam, yeah so, and just to kind of circle back so currently on the staking topic you know we are offering 10 percent apr on uh on your on your the total of your bag being staked there is no locking periods you can remove your tokens at any time um currently um you know as i said there's a two percent and two percent out and a six percent harvest but no locking periods so you know i still like to think that you know we're, we're offering a, a better apr than most um you know we've been running a high apr for majority of our life and now it's time to focus on sustainability and that's one of the reasons why the taxes are in place um you know with our staking contracts everything that's generated goes back into the staking contract Yeah, thanks for the clarification. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks for the question, Goldberg. Uh, one second. So we'll, we'll let um, one last question come in. No, that, that's from Rayen. He had a text question, but um, now he can open up his mic and, and shoot away. So Rayen, if you're there, please ask away. Yes, brother. Can you hear me properly? Yes, yes, yeah, I, I can hear you. Okay, so uh, you have mentioned that uh, you also have like NFT marketplace. So I wanted to uh, know that uh, creator have the uh, opportunity to like uh, edit the NFT swear so, uh, like at uh, 3D or in any in animated. Uh, are they 3D? Is that what you asked? I'm asking about the in the marketplace creator have the opportunity to like edit the NFTs like 3D NFTs and animated NFTs like this. Sorry, I didn't really understand the question. Did someone else? I believe, yeah, I believe he asked um, if if the if the NFTs can be edited. Edited? Uh, no, no, not 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 after not after they're minted. Uh, no, you can't edit your your NFT. Uh, once the NFT has been minted, it is what it is. You know, if you are the developer of the project, um, you can make changes to the collection before it goes live. But after it's live and it's being minted, you can't turn around and and add attributes to them or take attributes away from that. Um, then you would find yourself in a situation where everybody's just adding uh, rare attributes to the NFTs. So no, that's not how our NFT marketplace is going to be working. 
Oh, got it. And one last question. So uh, if I uh, uh, stake uh, multiple NFTs, suppose more than one NFT, so it will be like, uh, 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 it will be like uh, uh, any type of hamper for my staking reward or any uh, other ecosystem, or it will be okay to uh, continue the giving the reward. Uh, I cut part of that question, but you repeat it one more time, please. I think you dropped off. Uh, <clears throat> so with our with our staking contract, uh, you have the ability to stake up to five of our NFTs. Obviously, we have to add the NFT to the contract that we are going to allow to stake. And the way that our contract is essentially working when it comes to boosting rewards, and this is just an example, nothing more. Uh, the APRs are not set in stone, so do not hold me to this. This is just for simple explanation purposes. Let's say that you stake an NFT on our platform and we are offering a 10% APR boost. So your first NFT that you stake, you get 10% boosted APR. The second uh, NFT that you stake, you get 10% of that 10% APR added. Um, and then additionally, so let's say 10%, let me do some quick math real quick, uh, 10%. 10%, 10, 10%, 10%. Oh, 10%. So the first NFT staked would be 10% boost. The second NFT staked would be 10% of that 10%. So it'd be an additional 1%. So now you have 11% APR boost. Um, so if you take a third NFT, you then get 10% of the 11% APR, which would then bump you to another 1.1%. So now you're looking at 12.1% uh, APR boost and the mathematical equation works all the way up to the fifth NFT. So we are not giving flat rates of, as an example, 10% for every NFT boosted. We are doing percentages. So um, 10 per, just for example, you know, APR boost is 10%. The second NFT, you get 10% of that first 10%, which is 1%. So now your APR boost is 11%. And then you do, you stake a third NFT. Now you're getting 10% of that 11% boost. And that adds up and the mathematical equation goes all the way up to five. Um, so there are, obviously you get the most bang for your buck for the, the first NFT, but we can't, as an example, um, offer five NFT stakings at 10% a piece. And now you're boosting your rewards 50%. Um, so we decided to opt this option. Um, my apologies if it doesn't make a lot of sense currently. Um, it's much easier to read it than it is to explain it. But that's how our boosting rules will work on in our staking contracts. Awesome. Thank you very much for answering that. And thank you for asking the question, Ryan um guys Thanks i want to wrap this up thank you so much for coming thank you ryan thank you so much for coming ship toshi dane and dub you guys did a very fantastic job um we need more projects like this in the space you guys are executing on all fronts and you guys aren't shy in what you do um use a seasoned and labels you know there's really not much more i can say you guys are doing a very good job and i hope you guys smash the new all-time high thank you yeah, so thank much you, for coming banks. yeah banks thanks for having us in your room uh definitely appreciate it thanks everybody for listening in and, and asking thank questions you. much appreciated y'all take it easy enjoy the rest of your night slash day we'll see you next time